American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network. For more information, go to queencitypodcastnetwork.com. We're now part of the Queen City Podcast Network. That's awesome. We're part of the network. Welcome to another episode of American, American Time Timelines. I'm Amy. And I am Mookie Wilson's friend. All right, that's Joe. Peter McElroy. All right, that's Joe. I met Mookie Wilson on an airplane Okay. back in the 70s. And... This is... Okay, my name is Joe. <laughs> that was a ruse. This is the podcast that brings you nostalgic, interesting, and crazy events in American pop culture history, year by year. Year by year. And it's episode one of season three. This is our new season, y'all. We and made it through the 90s, then we made it to the 80s, then... And it's just going to get crazier. This is the 1970s. Now we're going to embark on the 70s. You know what the 70s were. 70s were crazy. But the crazy, funky colors of the 60s were leaving out, and people didn't know what to do next. I think that's why the 70s were crazy and brown and orange and... Well, and I was looking no, at no. a lot of images from the 70s to prepare for this. And it, even like if you look up images from the 1970s, a lot of recipes, pictures of recipes, like finished. Yeah. Like, and they all contain jello, every one of them. Everything it's like has they would even put like gazpacho in jello and, and like salty <sighs> foods and, and th- for some reason. And then the other thing was they loved to put in googly eyes on everything. Like googly eyes there were, were a big googly thing eyes on, on everything. Yeah, we did have googly eyes. I mean, it was like a new invention. It was like everything was space. I guess. I don't know if googly eyes were a new invention, but they loved st- sticking them on shit. Yeah, the beginning of 1970, I don't know what it was like. I can't imagine because I was not alive. Nope, neither was but I. But disco didn't start till the 70s, right? Right. So I always kind of confuse that with the you know, the 60s and the 70s. You had disco confused in the 60s? Well, I thought it started in the late 60s, but I guess... Disco? Was, no, yeah. late 70s. Oh, late 70s. Huh? Yeah, disco well, went into the 80s, early 80s. No. Yeah, it did. Really? Well, disco didn't die until like 80, maybe 81 yeah, or 82. Yeah, I guess that's... Well, we'll see. We'll see what you say after this podcast episode, because I got a little disco research, baby. Sweet. Disco fever. So that's a 70s. That's all 70s. Yes, it is. And so start us off at the beginning of the year, well, babe. There's a few things, as a, as a lot, as I want to do. Yes. There are certain, a bunch of little just tidbits and things that don't really have dates to them. Right. That I like to just bring up at the yep. beginning of a, an episode. Like, what and, do you got? And right here at the start of season, season three of American Timelines. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a throwback to one of our previous episodes. Um, I think it was the 1997 episode, in oh. season one. Um, it it was something I mentioned that goes from 1970 to 1997. We'll see if you remember. Okay. Elton, a young man named Elton John. Oh, he number one hit every year. He, he charted a top 40 single every year. That's right. Starting this year, 1970. All the way. Episode one of season three, all the way to episode... Whatever it was. Seven of season one, 1997. Wow. 1970 to 1997, a top 40 single every single year, Elton John. That's a bad motherfucker. And what was this top 40? Okay, the first one was Your Song. Oh, and I would tell everybody, this is your song. I hope you don't mind, I hope you don't mind that I put down in words. Well, just so you know. I love that song. Also, Crazy Glue was introduced in 1970. Oh, you're kidding. Although the main ingredient, cyanocrylate, was Mm -hmm. discovered in 1942 by Harry Coover while working for Kodak, crazy glue wasn't actually introduced until 1970. Wow. Isn't that that, that funny? That's good. Uh, The Boeing's jumbo jet debut. Now, is crazy glue the one that the the commercial where the guy's hanging by a hard hat with a brick? You know that commercial? I don't know. Was it crazy glue or super glue? I don't know. I I think that was crazy glue. Do you remember that commercial? Nope. He's got, it's like some guy in a wife beater and a, he's got a hard hat. Wife beater and on top of the, the hard the, hat. Is, wife beater is not acceptable nomenclature in the Me right. Too movement. All right. And 
ab above that is a brick, and then he's hanging on a beam by the brick from that's on his hat, and it's it sounds a little familiar, but I don't know if it's worth discussing. For well, some people are going to be like, lines. "Yeah, I totally remember that commercial," just because you don't think it's worth it. Listen to all the bullshit Dear, that I had to sit through Dear, for the entire 1980s with wrestling and the stuff that I could give a shit less Dear, about. Dear American Timelines listeners, please tweet us at History for Jerks and let us know. Uh, do if you, you care remember that about commercial that story? And do you, do you remember it? And if you do, are you happy Amy went on and on and on about it for I was just trying to describe minutes. it. Now, that's a pretty good description. Um, also, Boeing's Jumbo Jet, the 747, debuted in 1970. Okay. That's pretty good. Yeah. Isn't that pretty good? I know, like, commercial. I think I remember that the jumbo jet being a big deal because people could, so many more people could travel, and they and it went so much further. Like, it went, it could go further away. So you remember when they came out? I don't that remember oh. that. I remember no, knowing that that, 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 that happened in the 70s. That happened in the 70s. There was so much more. Uh, yeah, it must have been. Well, you know, you used to be able to smoke cigarettes on planes. Yeah. That's true. Uh, Samsung uh, originally sold noodles, just so you know. Samsung? Samsung was a noodle uh, sales company, only sold noodles. It no. wasn't It wasn't until 1970 that they started selling electronics. That's weird. It was a noodle shop, Samsung Noodle Company, uh, and now they make my phone. Yeah. Um, another thing, one other thing that happened in 1970, but I, I looked and I looked and I just couldn't find the exact date. Okay. Um, Orville Redenbacher... Uh, was born. He paid an advertising company thirteen thousand dollars to come up with a name for his popcorn company. Oh, and they decided originally. Yeah. Originally, it was called Red Bow because it was Orville Redenbacher yeah. and his buddy, whose last name was uh, Bowman or something. Mm -hmm. And they were called Red Bow. And they're like, "Yeah, that's stupid. Mm -hmm. We need something more catchy. What should we do?" And they paid some advertising company thirteen thousand dollars to come up with something. And they said, "Ah, yeah, just choose your fucking name." Really? <laughs> and so he went with Orville Redenbacher, his actual name, and. uh and it, um, and everybody knew how to pronounce yeah. it for some reason right away. It it took the world by storm because I think all of his commercials were like, "I'm Orville Redenbacher." Yep. I think everybody stopped and was like, "Who the hell is this guy? Why is yeah. he saying his name?" And so they were right. And I guess they uh, made their thirteen thousand dollars back in popcorn. Yep. Now, when we start the year, January first, nineteen seventy, we started the year with the number one song left over from 1969 which we will end up yeah which we will end our fourth season talking about probably that's right diana ross had the number one song to go in the new year from december 27 1969 all the way to january 2nd 1970 diana ross and the supremes someday we'll be together someday we'll be together yes we will yes we will Someday, there, there's a. It, it's going to be amazing to me the difference in different. the quality of music from the 80s going down to the 70s. Yeah, I, like I've noticed that just doing the research. I'm like, these are these are all going to be really good, good songs. songs. Yeah, it, it was although it was released as the final Supreme song featuring Diana Ross, mm -hmm. who left the group for a solo career in January of 1970. It was recorded as Ross's first solo single. And Supremes members Mary Wilson and Cindy Birdsong do not sing on the recording. Oh, they don't. But they both appear on the B-side. He's my sunny boy. Yeah, I don't know that one. You know that one? Mm -hmm. But this is the whole thing, too. This is the the, the, the B-sides. Yeah. It's, those have gone away. Yeah, like, we course. don't have those anymore. And you, like, you talk to younger people, they don't know what a, don't, what's a B-side. What's a B-side? They don't even know what a 45 is. Yeah. So I guess now, uh, sometimes folks still put out EPs. And there's a, a B-side would be the secondary songs on those, I guess. But, mm -hmm. but when you look at the Billboard list of top songs if you look at 1970 it's always two songs it's always the, the whatever it is yeah, and then the b-side song and then the b-side um because <laughs> they automatically were listed so let's explain quickly what what it is for people that don't know that what a b-side was well any music you bought if you bought a single it was on our little tiny record yep called a 45 a 45 just a smaller version of a big record uh they're not called records what are they called vinyls vinyls that we called them records. Yeah, the young kids say just that's what uh, music nerds like is records. They they yeah they collect vinyls. Yeah, but that was all you could buy then. Yep, there was no tapes. There was eight tracks maybe. When did eight tracks start? In the seventies, but I don't think yet. Yeah. Anyway, an eight tracks. I don't get an eight track. That's no, weird. that's so dumb. But uh, yeah, so you had to, you bought a, a little record, and why would you not put something on the other side of the record? You can flip it, 
And uh, so I imagine a lot of bands and artists had to really think about, well, what's our B-side going to be? Yeah. Well, and so the A-side was the hit. It was always the hit. It was always the song they're releasing. That's right. And then the B-side, the other flipped over the so record. And see, it was usually a crap song. Anyway. Ross, uh, Diana Ross reunited with Wilson and Birdsong in 1983. Did you know that? Performing the single for the Motown 25 oh. yesterday, today, forever television special. That's the one where Michael Jackson did his unleashed. Oh, iconic moonwalk. Unleashed his moonwalk on the world. Yeah. Um, but that performance was marred by lingering hostility between Ross and Wilson. Oh. Uh, which Motown insiders report ins- resulted in Ross shoving Wilson out of her way during the onstage performance. Oh. Boom. Is that cool? Diana Ross is the diva and a half, I bet. Oh, God. I yeah. bet she's. Oh, you, she, she's well, I have, theater. I have seen her writer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this, this is the one we, when anybody asked, what's the craziest writer you ever saw? I always bring up hers because there was actually a stipulation in it uh, that stated that she, um, could, <laughs> she refused to be in any rooms that weren't white. <laughs> yeah. Like, at all times, she had to be surrounded by white backgrounds. Yeah. Um, so it wouldn't, it's not just the green room had to have white walls. Like, she had to have white. So where did you put white sheets on yeah, everything? We, hu- we hung pipe and drape, white pipe and drape all the way from this oh my green God, room to the so stage. Weird. So she could be surrounded in white, draped in white. But when you're hurt, somebody like that, you can do what you want. Yeah, you can. Yep. But I'll never forget. I oh don't know. I thought it was her, but I think it was Natalie. Natalie Cole wanted like eight boxes of cereal. They had to be a certain size box, and then she never opened any of them and left them all. What? <laughs> so we had to buy all the cereal and then just give it to stagehands. That's cool. How come you never bring any of that shit home? No, oh, I you know sometimes I don't find out about it till oh. later. There's a lot of more needy people than me, babe. I know. I'm not the only person that gets to take everything. Okay, uh, and then also on January first, nineteen seventy, the movie Mash was released. Yes. Um, so yes, it was a movie before it was a show. The movie Mash, yes, which is before the show didn't come out till seventy two, I believe, uh, which I've started watching on Hulu because because of our podcast and yeah. that, that episode that the the finale of Mash was the most watched episode. That's of right. Any television show and in all history? The, t- all the sewers backed up and yeah, yeah everybody pooped as soon as it was over. Yeah. Everybody pooped. <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> it's a weird phenomenon. Everyone held their poop during Mash because that's when everyone poops apparently. Yep. Uh, so everybody pooped at once when Mash was over. So that just made me <laughs> say, I gotta know what the hubbub's about. Yeah. I gotta watch all nine seasons or whatever oh it is my of God. Mash. It's going to take some time. I it mean, went into the 80s if it started in 72, went through the 80s. Wow. So, yeah, you would, you'd have to watch MASH pretty much straight for yeah, about I, a year. I can't say I'm going to watch get every episode. The entire catalog. Really, I'm really finding uh, it's really misogynistic. Like, yes. Really. I mean, yes. We're in the Me Too movement now, so I'm sure everything you look back on is. But it's really bad. But basically, it's about the two alcoholic doctors who can do whatever they want sexually harass everybody yeah they can do whatever they want because they're they're doctors nobody else they need them yeah. so bad that they can't it's find a power the doctors, so abuse just, of power they just do whatever they want and say whatever they want and grab whoever they want and they they really just treat the ladies like they're pieces of meat and get drunk in the morning yeah that's pretty much but the movie i have not seen so pardon me feels like should i watch the movie first and then it's gonna be them? probably similar yeah it'll be similar i think the except except uh uh, uh, Elliot Gould is the lead in yeah. the movie, and I, I don't know. Maybe it's just not being somebody who wasn't born until seventy six. But Elliot Gould doesn't. Um, He's not sex symbol material. He doesn't strike me as as a successful actor. Yeah. But I think people much older than us, the generation, Would say, kind yeah. of bro, they think, oh, Elliot Gould, he's the shit. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I've always thought of him as the fat, curly haired guy from Saturday Night Live, and. He was in Saturday Night Live? Well, he hosted a lot. He was oh. in the Five Timers Club. When oh, he was. The, the Frequent Hosters Club. And he was just in different sitcoms and stuff all the time. Like, uh, you know, he's like uh, Bruce Valanche to me. But yeah. Other, other people would be shocked and slap my face. Um, say, anyway. Oh, God. Elliot Gold. So now we're talking about, in this episode, I want to say that we're going to talk about these movies from 1970. And Amy and I sat down. We thought, oh, let's do a little research. Let's maybe watch a couple of these. Uh, but we're also very cheap, so we decided not to pay for any. So if we could find any for free, we'll watch them. Yep. And we only found one for free, and we're not still not done with it. But but we did what we did do. Our dedication comes through in yes. the fact that we watched all the trailers for yes. these movies. So we Correct. watched the Mash trailer. Um, and so those of you that have seen Mash, here are some tidbits. Uh, 
the the first take of the shot where Hot Lips is revealed in the shower didn't work Mm -hmm. because Sally Kellerman anticipated the reveal and was already lying on the floor when the tent flap went up. But to distract her, Robert Altman, the director, and Gary Berghoff, who plays Radar, he's a little guy, he's Mm -hmm. one of the only people that's in both the show and the movie. He entered the shower tent and dropped his trousers while the shot was rolling outside. And while Kellerman was staring at them, the tent flap was raised, resulting in her genuine surprise and shock when she realized what had happened. So he's sunning her? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. He showed us nuts. Sunning. <laughs> is, that what, is that when you just drop your front? You yeah. show your front? That's called, is, yeah. that, is that called that? I think. Or did you just make that up? No, I think that's what it's called. That's what we used to <laughs> call it. Mooning. Like, put your butt out. I've never heard the term sunning. Oh, you haven't? Like, apparently Gary Berghoff showed her his junk. Uh, in order to get her to be surprised and shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this wiener. Yep. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, <laughs> he's standing naked beside the room. That's so funny. So you see her surprised in that movie. If you go back and watch that movie. He's, he's staring at his dick. Yeah, picture Gary Berghoff's penis. Uh, Tom Skerritt recalled that the dialogue was about 80% improvised in this movie. Uh, in order to create a different kind of atmosphere, Robert Altman cast some of the parts from improv clubs who had no previous movie experience. Oh, that's pretty sweet. It's pretty smart. So uh, how much of it is improv? Uh, 80%. Oh, oh, wow. According to Robert Altman, this was the first R-rated movie to use the word fuck in it. But apparently it wasn't his idea. During second unit shooting for the football game that comes near the end of the film... John Shuck was told to say something really nasty to his opponent. Mm-hmm. Shuck came up with, all right, bub, your fucking head is coming right off. And it made it in the film's final cut. Wow. It's the first time they said fuck? The first fuck in an R-rated movie. Really? So that, that leads me to believe there were X-rated movies that had fuck in it. Yes. Well, I guess. I wonder when the first X-rated movie was, but we'll fo- probably find out. I did read doing some research, and I don't know if I wrote it down, so I might not bring it up, but so I'll bring it up now. There were movies that were rated x there's a lot more X-rated movies. But they, not they sexual. Yeah, they weren't dirty sex movies. They were just had some bad words in them because people were more prudish. Uh, then, yeah. That later they changed the ratings. Like so, some okay. got downgraded to R. Yeah, so, so, that makes sense. So there probably were, it probably used to be, and if there's an F word in it, it's X mm-hmm. immediately. Yeah. You know, so I don't know how many had F in it, but it's interesting. Mm. Uh, maybe we should take a film class. <laughs> no more. All our spare time. Yeah. And then January 3rd of 1970 was when uh, Diana Ross and the Supremes lost their last number one single to be on the chart together as the Supremes. Mm -hmm. It was not number one anymore because B.J. Thomas came by and said, yo, motherfuckers, I'm about to drop some motherfucking raindrops on my motherfucking head. (laughs) That's a good song. (laughs) Raindrops are falling on my head. (laughs) That does mean to to soon be turning around. I wonder if the uh, I wonder if um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid was that song is from that movie. Yeah, so that's funny. I did not know that. I was going to drop that knowledge on you. I looked that up. Did you know? I can't believe this is that. Mm-hmm. You knew that, huh? Yeah, there's a scene where he's riding in the bike with his girlfriend. Have you ever seen the movie? It's a really good movie. A bike? Isn't it a western? Yeah, they're it's like they're just in a yard, little yard, and they're. It's like a montage of them being lovers, and they're like riding a bike together and stuff. Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid are lovers? No, it was uh, Sundance Kid's girlfriend. It was Robert Redford. Was yeah, but, right? it was a Sundance Kid. Who was Butch Cassidy? Paul Newman. Oh, I think I'm mixing this up with something else. I was thinking it was John Wayne. Who was John Wayne? He was in it? No, John no. Wayne was probably <laughs> dead. What am I thinking of, Butch? I don't know what you're thinking of. Um, this one's a really good movie, though. You should watch it. I think, so I think I had to watch this, and I did take a film class you in college. You probably slept through it or something. Well, I was high a lot in yeah. college. Like, I, I really enjoyed marijuana and yes. the way it makes you feel in college. So you went to school high a lot? Well, I, don't, I, I think I went to school normal, and then I'd see somebody I know, oh. and they'd say, hey, you want to smoke a J in this breezeway? And I'd be like, well, of course. Yes. Uh, but I didn't, a lot of times I didn't think of the concept. I didn't think, oh, well, I'm going to, I should have said, I'm going to class. That's not a good idea. Right now <laughs> right. I need to pay attention. But instead, I was like, "Yes, I will take every opportunity to That's smoke right. a joint." Um, anyway, <laughs> and that song was written by Burt Bacharach and Hal David. Burt Bacharach was a big fucking deal in the seventies. Oh yeah, you know. Um, 
you were so it won an Academy Award, like you said, knew, you knew us from that. Yeah. Um, but they were BJ poor BJ Thomas. Yeah. Now I think BJ Thomas recorded. Uh, we're gonna have to look this up. This might be a correction. Apology. I'm gonna go ahead and say it. I believe BJ Thomas mm-hmm. was the original singer of the Golden Girls theme song. What? Thank you for being know, yeah. a friend. There's a different mm-hmm. version. The original the song. The one where he goes, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, that's the gospel guy. <laughs> <that's> exactly, <laughs> on YouTube. Which is great. If you look on YouTube and yes. just look, at, look up gospel version of Golden Girls. Oh, my God. It's hysterical. That might be the greatest thing ever. That was my ringtone for uh, yeah. probably three different years of my life. It uh, is so good. <laughs> so good. It's my paw right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. You really yeah. have to look at it. Stop what you're doing right now. Look at that. It's so um, funny. It's great. But anyway, but I think B.J. Thomas sings that. Anyway. There's a woman sings that. No, the, for the, the TV show, but the original is a guy. No, no, it's Andrew Gold. Never mind. Sorry. All right. Whole BJ, I just remember that. Point. So I don't have to do a correction apology because I remembered Andrew Gold sounds just like B.J. Thomas to me. Okay. Anyway. B.J. Thomas, I do think, though, mm-hmm. <laughs> again, another possible correction apology, I think he did sing some sitcom theme songs, like Growing Pains or something. There's some of them out there, I think. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong. <laughs> I don't know where you're thinking that. Uh, there, there's at least one TV sitcom that he sang, if not seven. I, I have no idea where you're but getting that. But speaking at. of number seven, um, Burt Bacharach said, yo, I don't like this recording. Please record it again to B.J. Thomas uh, six times. Oh, he, had re- he had to re record it seven times. So that was uh, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. That's a good song. Mm-hmm. And I, that brings back tons of memories from me being a kid. I remember hearing that on the radio. Or my, and my mom, I think, would sing it every time it rained. Yeah. And Monday, January 5th, 1970, just two days after that, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head became the number one song. Mm-hmm. Um, Here's Lucy was on television, and it was the top, it was the third most popular television show here's lucy here's lucy starting starring lucille ball as lucy carter oh. a widow with two teen children really who takes a job as a secretary for her stuffy brother-in-law i didn't know that she did that yeah i, well, I, I wonder how long that was on for. i i, yeah, I should have written that down but it, it was a couple of years i think and yeah i had no idea either that she was on a sitcom where she was it was like a it's just called here's lucy and on this particular episode, mm-hmm. you know, Lucy's got star power, so she probably always had special guests. But uh, Craig's high school high school club initiation scavenger hunt includes a candelabra that Craig borrowed from Liberace. Lucy, of course, thinks it's been stolen and feels obliged to return it to the famous pianist. A cute song and dance segment follows as the whole family ends up with Liberace at his home. Oh. Liberace guest starred. On that yeah. sitcom. On the sitcom. Isn't that something? I feel like Liberace was on a lot of television in the 70s. I think he's been on soap operas and stuff. And you know what? I, also, I think in the 80s he was on some soap operas. I think he might also have been gay. <laughs> Maybe. I'm not sure. It's an idea. Getting some far out ideas. I, my gaydar is starting to go off whenever I see Liberace. Yeah. Uh, and then on uh, Sunday, January 11th, 1970, it was the Super Bowl. Yeah. The Super Bowl happened, and uh, oh, I didn't write what the Super Bowl was. Super Bowl number, or whatever. But anyway, the Minnesota Vikings were in the Super Bowl. Oh, That's that was right. the last time they were in, isn't it? No, <laughs> no, they were in four in the seventies. Okay, don't get feisty now. No, that might not be true. They might might have had one in the sixties. Because they've been in four, mm-hmm. but they got their asses beat, even though they were heavily favored. Okay. The Chiefs beat the Vikings twenty three to seven. That's how they always lose like uh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When everybody thinks they're going to win, yep. and it's a dominant. Every time, still does that. Yeah, they still do that. But I wasn't born yet, so it's not my fault. Vikings were favored by twelve point five. Oh, this is Super Bowl four. I did write it down. So yeah, they were all in the seventies, and I think this is the first Super Bowl they were. In. The Super Bowl four. Super Bowl four. Four. So they, I thought the Super Bowl has been around for a lot longer than that. No, it started in the late sixties, but before that, there were NFL championships. Oh. But they weren't called the Super Bowl until the AFL and the NFL merged. Oh, that's right. Okay. And, and now there's the AFC and the NFC, but they're all part of the NFL. But anyway. Yeah. Um, Super Bowl four is also notable for NFL films miking up. The Kansas City Chiefs head coach Hank Stram mm-hmm. uh, during the game. This is the first time a head coach wore a microphone oh, during the Super yeah. Bowl. Mm-hmm. So you know, 
they never did that before. So he's probably cussing and oh, there's tons of he talks like this. I'm Hank Stram. You know, Hank like, Stram. Uh, yeah, but why you do that? And he's wearing a suit, you know, on the sideline like the old days in the mm-hmm. like '60s type stuff. So that was memorable. Len Dawson was the MVP. Now, why is it? Why is the it the quarterback or the Chiefs coaches advice? that? How come coaches in football don't wear uniforms, but baseball coaches wear uniforms? I don't know. I I don't know. I don't. I've always wondered that, but I'm going to take a guess. Okay. You know how we talked about then in the '80s that Pete Rose, who was gambling, yeah. was a player manager. Oh, so sometimes they play. Yeah, I think they played. Maybe. Why do they still wear? Maybe them? there was more often player managers in the younger, and now they. still... I don't. I don't know why they still do. Is it so dumb looking? Maybe they are always like an emergency player. Like yeah, if, something. Like maybe still are. Maybe these old guys will get off and play if if some if they ran out of players. It's probably something we could look up and find the answer to really easily. But I've probably, just always wondered it. Probably isn't a good manager. Like, like think how ridiculous it would be in other sports. Like I know. What if in the NBA they wore? Same you know, outfit as the that, players. A tank top, or what if? Uh, yeah. In hockey, they wore a helmet yeah. and a, you know. Uh, Even the football playing would look weird and stupid. Yeah, with a helmet, big on. giant pads <laughs> and <laughs> stuff. It's, yeah, it is pretty <laughs> it's stupid. So dumb. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's stupid. Maybe it's probably because they're comfortable. Like in baseball, those are uniforms. It's are like unitard. <laughs> well, no, they're different. They're I different. know. They're There's just, two pieces, but it just it looks, looks the like same color yeah. sometimes. Yeah. I'm sure they don't wear a jock strap because jock straps aren't comfy. So why do they wear the rest of it? If you're you going to wear it, you got to wear the whole thing. Do you know that um, it's, um, this is speaking of somebody who's worn both a jock strap and a dance belt? Yes. They're basically the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> the only difference is you, uh, jock strap has a slot for a cup. Oh, right. Which I couldn't wear. It just I couldn't run with it. The cup was too big. Cover my junk, baby. It was too big? <laughs> yeah. Or too small? Hey, you wouldn't you want too, the cup to be sm- too small? No, because you want it to cover everything so you don't get hit in the nuts, but then you can't run if it's too big on your legs. Oh. Like it wasn't form fitting. It was weird. I don't know. It's like wearing a cod piece. How can you run with a cod piece? Yeah. But then if you don't wear it, then you hit the nuts and your life is over. I I'm just picturing dicks and balls right now in my head. I know. You love dicks and balls. Well, I don't you care know, for nine it. times out of ten, nine days out of ten, you're picturing dicks and balls. Like when I see you on I the just, street I, walking around. I'd rather just, not be. Doom, 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 doom. I can tell you're picturing balls and dicks. Nope. Okay. You need to now, you have some guessing to do. We're in the Super Bowl, young lady. So you have oh, a, you uh, have no a national anthem singer to guess and a cost of a Super Bowl ad to guess. I'm never going to. Cost of a Super Bowl and ad, I'm never going to get. You have a halftime show to guess. I bet the cost of a Super Bowl ad was a lot lower. Well, you figure. I just mean even then you would think. I bet it was probably like. like if you had to guess, 1970 television. Like $10,000 or something. That's that's pretty low. Yeah. Don't don't be an idiot now. Well. Our, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know how you would even guess. No. $78,000. Okay. Pretty low, that's, but not as low as you think. It's expensive, I would say, for 1970. For 1970, 78 grand. I mean, you'd be like, oh, 78 grand, gee. Yeah. What, are you going to buy a Super Bowl ad with that? They said the um, average worker only made like 9000 something a year. Oh, yeah, probably $10,000. I could see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was what Gosh, it was. you imagine? Yeah. It's crazy. just a different world. Inflation's, inflation's a crazy thing. It is crazy. And do you want to take a stab at the Super Bowl national anthem singer? Was it a man or a woman? It was two fellas. Uh, and I don't think you'll get... You might get one of them if I drop this hand. All right. Um, he was a late-night musician. One of the late-night bands. One of the late-night talk show bands. Oh, leaders. God. I don't know. He was Johnny Carson's band leader. Oh, God. I Now that's on the tip of my tongue. And he looked just like my stepdad when he had a mustache. What's it, who is it? It rhymes with Fock Peverinson. Oh, Doc Severinson. Yeah. Doc Severinsen and Pat O'Brien sang the national. I don't know who Pat O'Brien is. I don't either. I thought maybe I didn't. I thought maybe you did. No. Um, and the halftime show was the Battle of New Orleans tribute uh, theme. Yeah. Tribute. Oh, <laughs> tribute. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Who knows that remember, it was way before they even did yeah, like real the pop bands. stars. Can you can we pause for like five seconds? I hate. To can you imagine drums. though in the seventies if they had like if you time travel back to the seventies and you'd be like, hey, hey, Super Bowl people, why not have a kick ass band? Right. Think of all the money you'll make. Have a kick-ass band, you know? Like, yeah. have a fucking Beatles. Have the Beatles. They're about to yeah. break up. And the Supremes are about to break up. Just have them perform. Saturday, January 31st, 1970, the Jackson 5. Oh. Was it- reach the top of the Billboard chart, and they push 
the raindrop on my head guy. Yep. <laughs> BJ <laughs> Novak. Whatever his name was. Um, BJ Thomas. Yeah. Blowjob Thomas. They push <laughs> blowjob right off, and they take over Is with a lesser known. No. Nope, a lesser known. That's later in the year. Okay. They, Jackson 5 were all over the 1970s, oh. by the way. This one, I Want You Back. Hmm. I don't know. The bass line of this song is considered by many as the greatest bass line of all time. Really? And although Gladys Knight had been the first to mention the Jacksons to Barry Gordy and Bobby Taylor, Motown is credited, Motown credited Diana Ross with discovering them. Um, oh, burn. And this was done not only to promote promote the Jackson 5, but also to help ease Ross's transition into a solo career, which she began in 1970, soon after the Jackson 5 became a success. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, poor so Gladys get, Knight. Yeah, poor Gladys Knight and the pimps. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I want you back. You would definitely know that. I want you back. <laughs> I want help? you back. I want you back. No, no it's it's totally, you totally right. Uh, I can't, I have it in my head, but I can't. Oh, yeah. That's the bass yeah. line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, baby, baby give me one more chance. Sure, I love, love you. Won't you know, please let me back, back in your heart. Terry Gordy, who, uh, <laughs> not Terry Gordy, uh, Barry, Terry Gordy was a wrestler in the, oh, okay. in the, in the uh, yeah. Uh, you just trying to slip fabulous, in wrestling in the 1970 episode. I got to slip in wrestling where I can because yeah. it's not Barry Gordy. There was some concern, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but there was concern about uh, some of these geez, These lyrics are like pretty adult, and we're having oh. these children singing about wanting to bang these chicks. Yeah. It's a little bit not uh, it's, cool. It's true if you think about it. Yeah, if you do think it's about kinda it. It's kind of creepy. It is creepy, but at the same time, it's fucking good. Yeah. Jackson 5 is great. Yeah. I love it. Like, I mean... Their songs are really, really, really good. Yeah. And just like you said, we were talking about the 70s. They're so much better than the 80s. 80s was garbage. Yes, it like, was. Let's just say it. 80s is garbage. Yeah. I mean, Jackson 5 is the sh- fucking shit. Yeah, a lot of it. A lot of them are going to be. And so I'm not saying I I'm not saying I condone Joe Jackson. Uh, uh, beating chemically, his children. No, not beating. Chemically castrating Michael to keep that voice. Yeah. But you really kind of understand. He's yeah. so good. It's gold. You have you have gold in your hands, <laughs> and you just. But oh no, it's gonna go away. His his voice is gonna change. We can't let that happen. We have gold right here. That's it's right. Like liquid gold. It's so good. So, anyone who has child stars, I recommend chemically castrating. No, them. no. <laughs> All right. I don't even know what chemically castrating somebody is. February seventh, nineteen seventy. Shocking blue knocks the Jackson Five off the top of the Billboard charts with Venus. Okay. I'm your Venus. I think, yeah. I'm your Venus. So that oh, was the f- original. That was the original. That's right. And it's good. And it's on the Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack. That's the original. The original is on the Guardians of the Galaxy. Yes, good. it is. And it's better than uh, the Banana yeah. Rama version. Oh, the Banana Rama version uh, had its own merits. Uh, this one was better. Yes. Um, but the uh, this somebody, when they wrote the uh, lyrics, they miswrote the line, the goddess of the mountaintop, mm-hmm. and this singer originally sang it as the godness of the mountaintop. What? In the original. It doesn't even make song. sense. The godness. Well, somebody just misspelled it. So yeah. She sang it that way. But then It later, was a he, I think. No. Mariska Veris. Oh, okay. It's a lady. Um, oh, okay. Later, later um, they corrected it. I'm your Venus. I'm your fame. And then on February 14th, 1970... Sly and the Family Stone hit the top of the Billboard charts. Oh, yeah. You know what song? I don't know. I want to thank you for letting letting me be be myself. I want to thank you for letting me Mm -hmm. be Mice Elf. No. Mice Elf. No. That's that's how it's spelled. Have you ever seen that? No. No. All right. We're moving on. (laughs) This isn't a joke. I'm telling you. If you look up the title of that song, it's called Thank You Mm -hmm. in parentheses. For letting me be myself. No, for letting me. F A L E T T I N M E is one word. For letting me. B, mice, M I C E. Elf, E L F. Where did you see that? H E I N. Everywhere. You didn't know that? Thank you for letting me be mice, elf. No, you're making it up. I'm not. I'm not. Why would it be that? The title is an intentional 
Mundagreen, or sensational spelling for thank you for letting me be myself again. Oh. And the third verse contains special references to the group's previous successful songs, dance to the music, everyday people, sing a simple song, and you can make it if you try. I really like Sly and the Stone, Family mm-hmm. Stone. Uh, everyday people, it's like, I'll, yeah. if that comes on the radio, on my, on my phone or mm-hmm. my whatever, I play it again every yeah. time. And thank you for letting me be myself. Mm-hmm. Always play it again. It's so great. Yeah. And I can't believe you didn't know that. I can't believe no. I dropped knowledge you on did. you about you, Sly and the Family Stone. You did. I didn't know that they did that. And you believe me? You totally believe what I just said? No. You believed it as soon as I said that word. I didn't know <laughs> what it meant. That's how yes. You, that's how you knew that's I was. That's the only reason I was like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> a sensational spelling. Yeah. Yeah. They really did that. So. All right. Yeah. I, I could have sworn you knew that. Anyway. Nope. Sly and the Family Stone are great. Uh, and then Monday, February 16th, 1970, Gunsmoke was on TV. Yes. I remember Gunsmoke. Uh, that was like the number two. Was it really? Or number one. I think it was the number one. It was one of the top television shows of the year. No, it was number two behind. But remember, as well, but that's yeah. out of five channels. So that's true. the number one shows are not always going to be really quality programming. Well, that same night that Gunbo- Gunsmoke was on CBS, Laugh-In was on NBC. Mm-hmm. And the guests on Laugh-In that night were Dan Blocker from Bonanza. Mm-hmm. Johnny Brown, Perry Como, Tom Smothers, and Flip Wilson. And it's also the same day that Joe Frazier knocked out Jimmy Ellis in five rounds for the undisputed heavyweight boxing crown. And I believe that you have some info for Monday, February 16th, 1970, don't you? I do. Um, I am going to preface it, though, a little bit, like oh. sometimes I do. Yo, wait, wait. Sometimes you preface things? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to preface it with a little bit of some earlier stuff. Okay. Um, I am going to... My story in for 1970 is the case of Dr. Jeffrey McDonald. Okay. You I don't, no, I don't know what this is. Okay. So I'm assuming it's somebody who probably murdered a bunch of people and raped a bunch of animals. All right. No one knew. So... Jeffrey McDonald was born in Queens, New York, and raised on Long Island. I've actually been to Queens, New York. Okay. Um, and he was voted most popular and most likely to succeed in high school. Uh-oh. He was senior class president and captain of the football team. Oh, that sounds like me. He won a scholarship to Princeton, and um, then he, he had a relationship with Colette Stevenson in high school, and they resumed their relationship. Now, I've never seen this Colette Stevenson person. Yeah. I haven't seen pictures. I've never heard of this person, but that she sounds hot. Yeah, well, she she was beautiful. She was? Okay. Did um, he murder her? Then on, will you just let me get She's to the story? Murder. He's going to murder her, isn't he? So on on um, September, September 14th, 63, they got married, and then they had- 63? We're not in the 60s, honey. No, I know. We had a uh, daughter, yeah, Kimberly, and was born in April 18th, 1964. Then they moved okay, to Chicago for, okay. and so he could go to medical school. And moved then moved to Chicago from- uh, uh, Queens, New York. Queens, New York. Yeah, and then to they go to medical school. Well, no, he was at Princeton. Yeah, and probably from Queens, New York. New York. And okay. um, then they had another child, Kristen. She oh, was born Kristen. in six, 1967. That's a nice name. Hopefully, she doesn't end up murdered. Then he joined the U.S. Army um, on okay. July first, nineteen sixty nine, and they moved to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Oh, Fort Bragg, not far from where we are here recording live. That's right, from our home studio in Charlotte, so, North Carolina. American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network. For more information, go to queencitypodcastnetwork.com. He held the rank of captain, and he was an army surgeon. Army surgeon? Yep. So, basically, he's Hawkeye from MASH. Yep, which could we're just be. talking about. It could be. So, um, on... What's the guy's name again? Jeffrey McDonald. Jeffrey McDonald. So, he's a honky? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> White guy? Uh, yeah. Is, I hon- guess is honky the, uh, the preferred, preferred nomenclature? Yeah, you okay. used that word twice now. You're so, honky. Um, on February 17th at 3.45 a.m. Oh, just a couple hours before that girl starting Marlo Thomas was on at so, 11. Um, dispatchers received a call from McDonald, who has said... Dispatchers? He, dispatchers at 911, or the police. They didn't. I don't think they had 911 yet, so the police... Oh, when was 911 invented? I don't we think it, w- it wasn't invented until... We'll probably get to it in the 70s, I think. They receive a call from McDonald who re- who says um, that people have been stabbed. He himself called? Yes. And says that just people, people have, have been, been stabbed. stabbed. And this is in Chicago or in Fort Bragg. In Fort Bragg, yeah, at his home. So That's then right. uh, some MPs arrive at 544 Castle Drive and find the front. That's military police to you yep. idiots. To find the front door closed and locked and the house dark. Oh, the house is dark. It's they locked. knock and no one answers. So they go to the back door 
the screen is closed and unlocked and the back door is wide open. Oh, shit. So, um, upon entering, they find... Um, what do they find? They find a five-and-a-half-year-old Kimberly dead in her bed. Oh, why do you have to kill children? She I don't was get it. clubbed in the head and stabbed in the neck eight to ten times. Eight to ten times. Then in the next room, they find two-year-old Kristen dead, oh, stabbed man. 33 times with a knife and 15 times with an ice pick. Now, I just said, hopefully these people don't die. Then in the third bedroom, Colette, ice who was pick. pregnant, was lying on the floor of the bedroom. She had been repeatedly clubbed. Both her arms were broken. And she was stabbed 21 times with an ice pick and 16 times with a knife. 21 times. That is... Now, I've watched a lot of Forensic Files. Yeah. That shows that it's it's somebody who knows the person because they are very upset. Somebody who doesn't know someone, you don't just kill them a couple... You just stab them a few times. You yeah. do 21 times repeatedly. It's, oh, they hate the person. So, um, next to... Um, also, um, a man's pajama shirt is draped over her body. Oh. Over, over top died? of her the, body. The wife's The body? wife's, yeah. Oh. Um, then on the headboard, in blood, the word pig was written. On the headboard, the word pig. It was written was in written. Colette's blood. Because she was in the bedroom. Yeah, she was in her bedroom. So McDo- Dr. McDonald is next to her. He's alive, but he's severely wounded. Oh. So, Wait a minute. But his wounds were not as severe or numerous as the rest of the family. So he basically has a couple slivers. Yes. Maybe a couple cuts and scratches. Maybe like... Well, one of his lungs was punctured. Well... From a stab wound. Well, probably from fighting all of his family, right? Could be. So anyway, he suffered cuts and bruises to his face and chest along with a mild concussion. Um, And the stab wound in his torso had also, like I said, caused his left lung to partially collapse. Um, So here's his story. He says that on that night, February 16th, he fell asleep on the couch because his daughter was in bed with the wife. And okay, the daughter crawled in bed because she was scared of the so gun went smoke in, episode that they watched, yeah, probably. So he went in, and he saw her, and she had wet her side of the bed. Ugh, so I'm, instead of... Yeah, i got to say, I'm not sleeping in B. Yeah. I'm with him on this So he, instead of moving her and messing with it, he just went to, back to the couch to yeah. go to sleep. You know what, what I would do in that situation? I went up right now, and you were asleep, yeah. and our daughter had peed the bed next to you. I would not only not sleep in that pee, but I would actually add to the pee by peeing on the bed. <laughs> I would pee on the bed more because it was already established. I was already peeing on the bed. So yeah, right, up. So right. I chance, appreciate that. It's my chance to pee on the bed with no consequence. So I would pee on the bed and then go sleep yeah, somewhere else. Yeah, you probably would. Yeah. So I would also poop on the bed. <laughs> All right. So he says um, he's awakened later by some screams that he hears. He hears his Ooh. wife and one of his daughters screaming. So as he rose from the couch... He was attacked by three male intruders. Three male intruders. Two white guys and a black guy. Of course. They always got to throw a black guy in there because there's racism. There's a fourth intruder who's this white female with long blonde hair, high-heeled boots, and a floppy hat on. And now he's turning into some kind of fantasy. So she's, um, he oh, says they, so strug- he, they struggle, and during the struggle, he um, his p- pajama top was pulled over his head and down on his wrist, and so he was kind of using the pajama top to ward off the stabs that were coming at him. I'm starting to believe this. And um, he's knocked unconscious. That was the last thing he remembered then. But he did remember that the girl had a can- was holding a candle and was chanting, Acid is groovy, kill the pigs. Okay. Yes, it is groovy, kill the pig. So he's making up a cult thing. Something, right? If he did it, he's just making up some people. So, but now I'm starting to believe this. So the it's ar- so bizarre. The Army CID did not believe his account. Because CID the, stands for? Oh, I didn't look. I can't remember. Corporal in distress? Something. No. It, corporal it's in like the, the Army's CID. investigation. Like the investigation yeah. unit. I bet we could come up with this. So de- they, de- Detectives. CI detectives. So they um, uh, they said the physical evidence didn't match. The um, one of the things was the living room didn't show it. It, didn't, it had like an overturned coffee table. Yeah. And a flower plant was knocked over, and that was about it. Yeah. So and so like, it's like, how would there be this stage? grown men struggling, and and that be all that happens? Um, and then the other thing he had said that when he went in and found his wife, yeah. he put he took his pajama top and. This is after he came to. Right. So he, he goes unconscious. When he came to to call the police, Yeah. he said that he, he when he found his wife, 
he he laid his pajama top on on her to like cover her up right and um then he said he went and he found his daughters and then he called 911 and then he passed out so that's how she got his pajama top on her okay so um but they found there was no fibers from the pajama top found at all in the living room but there was a, there were several found under Colette's body and in both of the girls rooms and he's according to his story he didn't have it on anymore when he went into the girls rooms oh, gross but but part of me is like f- that fiber evidence it's like what is it like one little skinny thread i mean how do they know maybe it was like a maybe it was like one of those pajama tops that just uh was fuzzy and it yeah. just shreds everywhere i mean isn't that don't you wonder about that, I would what, think is, that what is that fiber wouldn't that pajama top be everywhere then the guy probably wore that pajama top all over the house that's the other thing but and maybe never went in the living room there was also a fiber found under Kristen's fingernails well that's a little bit more more damning evidence yeah the murder weapons were both were found outside the back door um it was a knife they were like under a bush and it was a knife a piece of lumber and an ice pick and they all three had come from the house so they weren't foreign objects. They're all items that were in the house originally. Mm-hmm. Now, what's the, this dude's motivation? Is he just a crazy guy? Well, that's what we... Hold on. All right. So man. Um, the word pig had been written with somebody using a surgical glove. Okay. And um, tips of the surgical gloves were found beneath the headboard where the word was written. And they were identical to a supply that McDonald kept in the kitchen. That he already had. Huh? Yes. You see, that's... They're not going to know that they're there. Like some weirdos will break in and even right. they said those weird things. So then with the blood, the family all had, the, there was a kind of an anomaly. The family all had different blood types. So That, that is definitely an anomaly. It is. So it Being helped, a blood type expert. Well, usually you inherit your blood type from your parents. So it's oh, weird okay. that they all had different blood types. Word. So um, that helped the detectives theorize what happened in the house because they followed the different blood types in the trail like where in each room what blood was there because uh-huh. they couldn't dna was there was no dna at the time so they could because everyone had different blood types they could just tell whose blood was where yeah so that's crazy so they're that kind of crazy? lucky that they all had different so they said the fight began in the master bedroom which turned physical with colette probably hit him on the head and caused his concussion and then he must have retaliated with his fist and the piece of lumber um as you do they I always they said that kimberly um may have walked in because her blood and brain serum were found in the doorway so she must have walked may have walked in and was hit in the head her brain what brain serum what's that i don't know it's probably gush from your head i guess yeah gross so they believe that then he why why let me just ask you this let me pause for a second why do you like all this (laughs) you (laughs) ask me that all the time why do you like this like you seem like a normal person to me on the outside you seem like a a lot of people like it What's wrong with all of you? I don't know. You seem like regular people. Don't shame. Don't shame us. But you, you know, like you go about your day, you brush your hair. You, are you thinking about this stuff when you're brushing your hair? No. Like, all right, listen, <sighs> listen. They think that he thought his wife was dead, so then he um, takes the girl that got hit in the head back into her bedroom, and then he stabs her um, to make it look like. He stabbed her and the other one so fr- in such a frenzy to make it look like it was a crazy attack. Ugh. So, because um, their blood was discovered on the pajama top, which McDonald said he wasn't wearing. So her blood, yeah, Kimberly's blood was on the pajama top too. Uh-huh. Um, he went to Kristen's room, but before that, Colette, whose blood was found in Kristen's bed covers and wall of her room, must have regained her consciousness and threw herself over Kristen and then he killed them both. Why don't you just let the baby live? Like, why do you got to keep killing everybody? So after killing them both. If he's going to call the police eventually, just call now. I kill everybody first. I I hear you. I I guess you're just insane, huh? Well, so after killing them both, he wrapped Colette's body in a sheet and carried it back to the master bedroom, leaving a smudged footprint of her blood on his way out. Then they theorized he attempted to cover up the murders using articles in the Manson family that they found in a magazine in the living room. What? There was an article, a Time magazine. About Charles Manson? Yeah, that on the cover it yeah. was the Manson family. And he used pictures they're saying from he, that? No, they're saying he just got the idea from oh, that. Oh, okay. Um, then they said he put surgical gloves on, wrote the word pig on the headboard with Colette's blood. Then he laid the torn pajama top over her and stabbed her repeatedly in the chest with the ice pick. Now, what if this? What if this really happened? 
what if all that really happened? These weirdos broke in and did all this that's, stuff. I know. That's the thing. And what if all that really happened? Poor guy. And then he just gets like he tried to f- battle all these weirdos. Right. So then they say he went, took a scalpel, went to the bathroom and stabbed himself once. And then he called the ambulance and discarded the weapons. So um, the next, that's what they think happened. That's what they think happened. Mm-hmm. So we'll just let you marinate in that horrible murder <laughs> yeah. uh, while, while Ironside was the number four most popular television show Ironside. in 1970. Ironside, are you familiar with that? No. Well, on Thursday, February 26th, 1970, Ironside was on NBC. Uh, this starred wheelchair-bound detective Robert T. Ironside battles the bad guys on the streets of San Francisco, starring Raymond Burr, Don oh. Galloway, and Don Mitchell. So that must have been after Perry Mason, obviously. I guess so. And, and with, with his assistance away, the chief receives a phone call telling him to expect a deadly visitor within 60 minutes. Ironside spends the remaining time improvising self-defense without weapons and trying to identify the call. <laughs> Jeez. So I'm just picking Raymond Burr sitting on a in chair. In a wheelchair. You know, this show probably started because Raymond Burr was like, hey, I put on some weight. I'm, I, 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 wanna, I, wanna, I need to sit down. Yeah, I want to star in your, uh, your action <laughs> yeah. thriller where I'm a detective, but can I, I just be sitting? I want to sit down. I just like to sit down the whole time. Yeah. And so Ironside, I would like to practice uh, weapons uh, with, by myself self-defense without <laughs> weapons uh for a while so that's ironside was on um and then on february 28th 1970 simon and garfunkel take over the billboard chart with a really slow like a bridge over is it right trouble yeah water. Water. you're right i yep. love simon and garfunkel now this is all art garfunkel singing this right yeah no i think yeah, uh, I think they both sing on it. He sings a lot of it, though. I think it's all Garfunkel. When they sing, like, Sail on Silver oh, they Girl, sing together. Maybe Sail it's on too. By. Um, But it's mostly Art Garfunkel. This song gets me every time. Like, I get sort yeah. of, like, sad and emotional. It's a really I good song. I love their, their Greatest Hits album. I know that true fans don't like Greatest Hits albums as a rule. but That's just a way for them to say they're better than you. I know. But I, I think their Greatest Hits album is one of my favorite albums. Well, um... Paul Simon saw Elvis mm-hmm. in concert in 1970, and he saw him cover this song. Mm-hmm. And Paul Simon said, we might as well just give up. Why? Because it was so good. Really? He loved Elvis's cover of this so much that he was like, oh, shit. Let's, oh, no. let's just give up. Nobody, n- nobody knows Elvis's version now. Oh. Nowadays. I, yeah, I, I, I watch, it's on YouTube. You can watch right, it. Right, but what I'm saying is the one that... St- stuck was Simon and Garfunkel's oh, version. Oh, yeah, their version was original. I mean, that was, yeah. they wrote it, yeah. and Elvis covered them. But if I watch it on YouTube. I don't think it's that great. Really? Because it just sounds like Elvis. Like, it looks yeah. like the honky-tonk man from WWF. <laughs> like, and he's real sweaty. Like, yeah. He's, he's really, I mean, he got was rough towards Yeah, he was. He I mean, was I'm real rough. I'm not sure when, we die, when he died, but we're going to have to cover it when he dies. But he was fat yes. and sweaty. And he... And it's just so cliche, though. <laughs> yeah. I think Elvis impersonators have ruined Elvis. Like, yeah. I really think they have. Like, mm-hmm. Maybe old school Elvis was cool, but. Uh, I do. I still like him, Elvis. But this was bordering on fat yeah. Elvis. Yeah. So it, I don't think it was that great. I think Paul Simon. And I can picture him. it. It's probably just like his in a ghetto, you know, like yeah. that kind of Yeah, and he's wearing the era. white jumpsuit and yeah. everything. But um, anyway, they thought it was so good that they were never going to do he it He still again. wore that awful jumpsuit and had real did. fat. Yeah. And you got a plum smuggler or something on. Yeah, plum smuggler, that's right. Yep. Thursday, March 5th, 1970, the movie Airport was released. Oh, my God. And this was hysterical. Yeah, we watched. Not, me- not meant to be. No, nah, yeah, it was supposed to be serious. But um, watching the trailer for this, you and I watched it, y- it's pretty obvious that Airplane, the movie, that's was right. just a, a, a spoof of this. Yeah. Which I had never known or seen. I didn't either. I mean, Airplane, the movie, we both know and we both love, but... It right. was pretty much frame for frame almost looked right. like airport. Yeah, the movie you airport. S- you, yeah, I was watching this uh, when we watched this trailer. We saw many of the scenes. We're like, oh, that's what they were. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's why they. Oh, that this lady got slapped on the, the lady plane. Got slapped and was yeah, hysterical. They're slapping her in, in an airplane. The movie. But this was supposed to be serious. It was like yeah. romance, adventure in the sky. It was like Jacqueline Bisset, Burt Lancaster, or yeah. whatever. Dean thing. Martin, Burt Lancaster, Dean Martin, George Kennedy, Jacqueline Bisset. Yeah, um, so. It was actually based on actual events. Apparently, the the first domestic terrorism uh, and the bombing of Continental Air, Airlines Flight Number Eleven oh. from O'Hare to Kansas City. But the film includes five Oscar winners: Burt Lancaster, Van Heflin, 
George Kennedy, Helen Hayes, and Maureen Stapleton, and one Oscar nominee, Quinn K. Ridiger. Um, I do, I do want to see it, kind of just to yeah, just to see. Seventies were so different in movies. Oh, I know. Um, yeah, so there's anyway. some real great movies, and there's some really crap movies right, from the seventies. Some of them are so iconic, and this is iconic for being shitty. Yeah, like everyone said, this was sh- so shitty. It made a lot. Did of they? It was the second most highest grossing of the year. But did reviews were bad? Yeah, reviews were terrible. Was, yeah, it was shitty. And then on Tuesday, March tenth, nineteen seventy. An episode, on episode eighty-seven of Sesame Street, mm-hmm. was the debut of a song that we all would grow to know and love, sung by Kermit the Frog. Uh, oh, it's not easy being green. It's not easy being green. I love that. Yep, that was the first time that was ever. Oh, it's so cute. Yep, that's such a good song. Huh? Yes, it that's is. I didn't know that debut on Sesame Street. Yep. Well, Kermit was. That's where he was first before the Muppet Show. He was on Sesame Street always. Someday we'll find it. The, the rainbow r- connection. That's not a bad impersonation. It's not easy being green. That's only one. That's the only thing I can do. Is Kermit, Kermit the Frog? Because I talked like Kermit the Frog and Ernie for like four years, yeah. five years of my life. <laughs> anyway, um, and then on Wednesday, March 11th, the very next day. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, the very next day, Wednesday, March 11th, was the Grammy Awards. Hosted by Andy Williams, your crush. No. Your celebrity crush. No. Andy Williams. No. Yeah, you've always had a thing. No, I never had a thing for Andy Williams. Do you know any songs he sings? You know what he's famous for? What's the biggest song he's famous for? Is it Moon River or something? Moon River. Is that right? Yeah. I don't know how that goes. Moon River, there go. wider Moon. than a mile. That sucks. Crossing you in style someday. Do you want to take a guess for album of the year in 1970? Um, it was from the year before, 69. 69, dude. Is it something from the Beatles? Nope. Mm. I don't know. Aquarius. Oh, Age of Aquarius. Let the sun shine. Yep, Aquarius slash Let the Sun Shine In was album of the year. That's a great song, too. Best new artist was Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Best new artist? Best new artist. Isn't that funny? Yeah. They that's were funny. new. Yep. That was before Young joined them. Yep. It's just Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Okay, now I need you to strap I on. love them, too. Crosby, Stills, and Nash? Yep, I love me some Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And really? Yeah. Yep. I love what are you, stuff. my dad? Yeah, I am. My dad loves Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Well, I'm listening to some Crosby, Stills, and Nash. You're going to start <laughs> echoing. Take my shirt off. You reclined. Care. I don't care. But I do need you to strap on your strap on because... Oh, you got something for I me? Got a big story here. Yes. Saturday, March 14th, 1970. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of Dr. Robert J. White? No. On Saturday, March 14, 1970, Dr. Robert J. White was able to completely swap the head of one monkey and put it on another monkey and have it remain alive for nine days. Ew. Yep. It's the first successful head transplant. Oh, my God. For nine days, that's successful? Yeah, well... Nine days, they put a head on another. I mean, I know. That's amazing. It like moved its body and everything. It's amazing. I'm just saying. It's not like, oh, now we can do these. Two rhesus monkeys were sedated and laid out on separate tables inside the fourth floor laboratory laboratory and labeled with letters A and B. The heads of both were removed and the head of A was attached to the body of B. Yeah, poor things. Can you imagine? That's awful. Terrible thing. Um, And it woke up and almost bit me, says Dr. White. It moved the muscles in its face, it blinked its eyes, it chewed on pencils. More important, it mimicked tests that it had been trained to perform before the operation, proving for the first time that consciousness, or the soul, as Dr. White believes, can be transplanted by removal of the brain. What they had performed, the doctors... Wait a minute, re- which, which monkey was trained? What, the they one- had, what they had performed, the doctors realized, was not a head transplant at all but a whole body transplant. The monkey that had survived was the A monkey. After all, the head. So so the head, the monkey whose head it was, was the one who was that, trained. Who was trained. And that, then they yeah. put that mm-hmm. head on another body, that and they the still knew the, how to do yep, the mm-hmm, test. Yep. Really? Your body is a machine for the brain, says Dr. White. The brain is where consciousness is located. Yeah. While the head was kept alive by the circulation provided by the bee monkey's body, the spinal cord had been severed at the neck, and so the new brain could not control the body itself. Nerve endings cannot be sutured like blood vessels. Machines were required to keep the monkey's lungs breathing and its heart beating. 
but the monkey could still hear, smell, taste, and eat and follow objects with its eyes. Ultimately, immune rejection caused the monkey to die after nine days. Some of that came from Bizarropedia, which is a thing that I didn't know existed. Yeah, I don't know any other. Thursday, April 2nd, 1970. Yes. The movie Patton. Yeah. Was released, starring George C. Scott. Mm Mm-hmm. He played Patton in the 1970 classic, and he refused to show up to the Oscars and accept his award because he said the whole thing is a goddamn meat parade. I don't want any part of it. A meat parade? What kind of comment is that? He believed that every dramatic performance is unique and cannot be compared. Okay. And did you know that soldiers who served under the real George S. Patton said that the general's voice was surprisingly high-pitched? Oh. And this can be heard in actual films and recordings of him. Patton himself said that he used profanity so liberally in order to compensate for this. Because he had a high voice. Yep. Yeah. And then Tuesday, April 7th, 1970, the 42nd Academy Awards were presented Mm -hmm. at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in Los Angeles, California. And for the second year in a row, there was no official host. Awards were presented by 17 Friends of Oscar. Bob Hope, John Wayne, Barbara Streisand, Fred Astaire, John oh, Boyd, Myrna Lloyd, Clint Eastwood, Clint Eastwood, Raquel Welch, Candace Bergen, James Earl Jones, Catherine Ross, Cliff Robertson, Allie McGraw, Barbara McNair, Elliot Gould, Claudia Cardindale, and Elizabeth Taylor. This was the first Academy Awards ceremony to be broadcast via satellite to an international audience, but only outside North America. Mexico and Brazil were the sole countries to broadcast the event live. Why in the world is it necessary to have 17 people host a show? I don't know. That's stupid. Whoa. It's just dumb. Midnight Cowboy became the first and so far the only X-rated film to win the Academy Award for Best Picture. I knew that. And that it was X-rated? Yeah. Midnight Cowboy? Mm -hmm. That's the one I think of whenever I think of like these kind of old-timey X-rated movies. Well, X-rating has since been downgraded to R. The previous... Why is it X-rated, does it say? No, the previous year had seen... No, it doesn't. The previous year had seen the only G-rated film to win Best Picture, Carol Reed's Oliver. Okay. Also this year, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? set an Oscar record by receiving nine nominations without one for Best Picture. They Shoot Horses, Don't They? You ever heard of that movie? No. What a dumb title. I didn't either, and my grandma didn't recall it either. I would ask her about as I was doing research from Your grandma dude. might not be and the best said, oracle of knowledge said, about these you, things. Do you remember that movie? And she said, no, but I remember George Kiroff. Uh, from, yeah, she starts talking about her neighbor. From the side of Toledo in, in 1929, Saturday, April 11th, 1970, the Beatles, the Beatles are the yep. number one spot in the Billboard chart. That's the cool thing about going back. Yeah. got good music. The fucking Beatles. Yeah. The Beatles you know are what like. What song? Let it be. 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 That's a great there song. There will be an answer. Let it be. Um, I I will admit, I still always I still hear that Sesame Street song. What? Letter B. Letter oh, B. Oh, I never saw that. Letter B. Letter B. I think it's Sesame Street where they just, they're just they teaching kids a letter yeah, B. Yeah, and, and they, they, they use B. that. So clever. Mm-hmm. But I always kind of hear that. But that's a great song, too. It is it a just, really good song. It just, like, tugs at your heartstrings. Mm-hmm. And it would be the Beatles' final single before, yeah. before Paul McCartney announced his departure from the band. I thought John Lennon's the one that left. No, Paul McCartney. Remember Paul? Remember John Lennon had that song about how can you sleep at night, you motherfucker? You yeah. the Beatles. That's uh, Paul's fault. He he announced he was going to leave the band. I thought John did because of Yoko. No, Paul McCartney did because of Yoko, probably. Mm-hmm. But um, both the Let It Be album and the U.S. single, The Long and Winding Road, were released after McCartney now is after McCartney's announced departure from and the subsequent breakup of the group. Mm-hmm. McCartney said he had the idea of Let It Be after he had a dream about his mother during the tense period surrounding the sessions for the Beatles' The White Album in 1968. According to McCartney, the song's reference to Mother Mary was was not biblical. The phrase at times been, has been used as a reference to the Virgin Mary. Nevertheless, nevertheless, McCartney explained that his mother, who died of cancer when he was 14, was the inspiration for the Mother Mary lyric. He later said, it was great to visit with her again. I felt very blessed to have that dream. So that got me writing Let It Be. He also said in a later interview about the dream that his mother had told him, 
it will be all right. Just let it be. When asked if the song referred to the Virgin Mary, McCartney has typically answered the question by assuring his fans that they can interpret the song however they like. Mm. But his mother's name was Mary. I see. Let it be, let it be. It was a good song. Whisper words of wisdom. That is a good song. But, I don't know, every time I think of the Beatles, I think, they got to be aliens, right? Like, how could anybody have that many yeah. unbelievable songs? Is it just because McCartney and Lennon together were both geniuses that happened to find each other? I think George Harrison, too. But Ringo was just a fuck. Ringo is just, yeah. <laughs> Ringo is Ringo. Shit. Yeah. yeah, George Harrison. Yeah, but George Harrison sang, Got my mind set on you. Yeah, but which he ruined his whole legacy. Right. But he sang some really good Beatles songs. But my theory, too, is if John Lennon would have lived, he would have made a bunch of crap like Paul McCartney has and George yeah. Harrison. Well, yeah. he would have gone through the 80s just like everybody else. And the 80s made everybody shitty. That's true. The 80s made everybody shitty. Every one of us. The 80s making people shitty. Yeah. It Not was. George Michael. No, his, well, it's, he didn't get good till 89. That was in the 80s. I know, but that's almost 90s. That was in the 80s. What about Bon fucking Jovi? They were mm. great in the 80s. Yeah. Hair bands were great. That's true. Motley Crue? Yeah, I guess some of those were pretty good. Oh, you love Motley Crue, boom. Saturday. I already said Saturday. The Beatles. This is so cool. We're talking about the Beatles. Uh, they were great. Yep. Tuesday. April 14th, just a few days after the Beatles Let It Be started just being inundated in everyone's radio stations. Mm-hmm. Just started being everywhere. The last episode of the Debbie Reynolds show starring Tom Bosley was aired. Starring Tom Bosley. I you mean, know who he was, don't you? Let's just be honest. He was Tom, a Charlie's Angel. Tom Bosley? Oh, no, 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 no. Bosley was, never mind. Bosley was the name of the character in Charlie's oh Angels. God. Tom Bosley was on Happy Days. I could fill a room with your wrongness right now. <laughs> Tom Bosley was a father motherfucking Dowling. And, and, and Happy he Days. was the dad on Happy Days. Two of the greatest roles in American history. Father, you watched Father Dowling? I never watched that. <laughs> no, but it was probably great. <laughs> father motherfucking Making Dowling, up. bitch. Making some shit up over there. Uh... A little known fact, Father Dowling was the inspiration for the rapper Father MC. Mm-hmm. That's where he got his name from Father Dowling Mysteries. All right. Maybe. No, but anyway, Father Dowling, Tom Bosley was the fucking star of the yeah. Debbie Reynolds show. Um, do you remember? The, do you know what, anything about the Debbie Reynolds no. show? No. Anyway, the series only lasted one season because NBC was selling ad time to cigarette commercials against Debbie Reynolds' wishes. Oh. Because she signed a two-year contract with NBC and owned half of the program, she was unable to be fired. So she walked away from the show instead. I think that it, they must be pretty soon nearing the part where the cigarette commercials became illegal. I think We'll probably get to that. But Debbie Reynolds once called this the stupidest mistake of her entire career. But she lost $2 million of income for quitting the show. And, uh, and at that time, that was a lot of money. Yeah, that was a lot. On, two, on Thursday, April 16th, 1970, Greg the Hammer Valentine made his debut no. in professional wrestling. No. And Gorilla Monsoon defeated Carl Kovacs via disqualification in the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. No, really? No. Yeah. Wrestling, yeah. Wrestling. No, you, you're adding no. some shit in. No, there was wrestlers in 1970. There they was? just weren't mainstream. Greg the Hammer Valentine's an old fucker. He's that old? But I bring this up because you have, meanwhile, while Greg the oh, Hammer well, Valentine's meanwhile, they, they Gorilla Monsoon's defeating Carl Kovacs. It's back they to finally. Story. Yep, they finally interrogated Dr. McDonald on April 16th, 1970. The police interrogated mm-hmm. him? Yep, that was all. While Greg the Hammer Valentine was making his debut I guess wrestling? so, yeah. And while Grill Monsoon was defeating Carl Kovacs? Yep. By a DQ? And then Wednesday, April 22nd, 1970, Ross Perot became the biggest individual loser ever on the New York Stock Exchange. Did he? He lost $450 million in a single day. Whoa. Can't finish? Can't yeah. finish, can't finish, can't finish. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then later they wrote that song about him, that Feliz Navidad. What? Feliz Navidad, Ross Perot. That is not to say Ross Perot in <laughs> yeah, that song. Do. No, they don't. <laughs> Feliz Navidad, Ross Perot, lost $450 million in a single no. day. I think that's the rest no, of the No, no, no. And then Saturday, April 25th, 1970, the Jackson 5 are back on top of the Billboard shorts with ABC. Yep. Easy as one, two, three. Now, this song, honey, mm-hmm. in 1970, is considered by some okay. 
to be one of the first disco songs. Oh, boom. Do you consider this disco? I would say no. Oh, so those some... Would be in can, opposition to me. You're saying those some can go shove it up their ass. Uh, no, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. I just think... Tell them to shove it up their ass. I just think it's too, it's too Motown to be disco. Um, excuse me, listeners who think this is one of the first disco songs, shove it up your ass. <laughs> Stop listening to our podcast. No, not no, no. Everybody has their own opinion. Okay. Sunday, April 26th, the day after Jackson 5 take over the Billboard charts, the Dallas Morning News reported uh, that a bomb consisting of 20 to 30 sticks of dynamite was detonated in the Senate chamber. Oh, man. The bomb was an apparent retaliation for the shootings of three African Americans by the police. A second bomb exploded at a Baton Rouge country club. Mm -hmm. A pencil remains to this day embedded in the ceiling of the chamber from the force of the explosion. Really? Yes. Wow. And that was because of three African Americans being shot by police. And so somebody was pissed about that? Yeah. In 1970. Wow. Some things never change. That's right. On May 1st, um, Dr. McDonald was formally charged with murder. He was charged with murder. So they, yes. after they interrogated him, now they haven't found anybody else. They think he did it. He formally charged him with murder. Yep. Dr. McDonald. And then Saturday, May 2nd, the very next day after that happened, mm -hmm. well, at first the Kentucky Derby winner was Dust Commander. Okay. Thank but, you for not making me guess. But after serving 20 years as mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, mm -hmm. get your outrage hat on because you're going to be mad. Okay. Alan Cavett Thompson retired in 1969, and mm -hmm. he formed Focus, a group that he touted as a supporter of the freedom of choice in America. Using that freedom of choice, Thompson's organization protested taxpayer dollars being spent to air Sesame Street. Ugh, in, re in response to the outcry, a state commission was formed in April 1970 to address whether Sesame Street should be permitted to be broadcast on public television. The five-person panel eventually ruled that the children's show should be banned. Oh. One of the members of the commission, likely upset by the decision, leaked the results to the New York Times Good and, for them. in which it became a major news story. A commission member speaking anonymously stated that some of the members of the commission were very much opposed to showing the series because it used a highly integrated cast of children. Oh. And furthermore, that the main objection was mainly that we're not ready for it yet in Alabama. Oh my God, how backwards. 22 days after its original decision, the commission reversed itself, and Sesame Street was approved in Mississippi, where it had, has remained ever since. However, for Good. 22 days, the show was indeed banned by Mississippi. Oh, makes me sick. Isn't that weird? Backward fucks. Just because of somebody's color. Yeah. It is awful. What a weird world we live in. I mean, we were founded on slavery, so why are we surprised? That's true. And then two days later, four Kent State University students were shot and killed. Mm, four by, dead in Ohio. By the Ohio National Guard during yes. the Vietnam War protest. Yep. Um, so we all know about the the, the Kent State shootings. Mm -hmm. Four dead in Ohio. That was by... Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Crosby, Stills, and Nash, your favorite group. Yeah. But did you know that in 2014, Urban Outfitters tried to sell a vintage, bloody-looking Kent State sweatshirt on the no. website? Yeah. Oh, Isn't that weird? That's awful. Did you know that Devo bassist and singer Gerald Cassell witnessed the Kent State shootings? No, I did not. That day he stopped being a hippie and focused on their concept of de-evolution, that mankind had begun to regress. Mm -hmm. That's where Devo came from. Oh, de-evolution. Yeah, that's not weird. And Devo started that, that early, huh? I always think of them as an 80s band. Well, it must have taken a long time to get That's up true. Them. You must whip it. <laughs> like a, they yeah. probably were like a, a really good, smart, intelligent band for years. And then all of a sudden they're like, now let's put these red tops on our yeah. heads and saying whip it. That's right. Whip it good. And then Friday, May 8th, 1970, the Eastern Division champion New York Knicks defeated the Western Division champion Los Angeles, Los Angeles Lakers in a best of seven series, four games to three for their first NBA title. The MVP was Willis Reed. I don't care about any of that. May 9th, 1970, the Guess Who mm -hmm. take over the Billboard charts. Do you know the band, the Guess mm -hmm. Who? Yeah. I, don't, I can't think of the song. You can think of any song by the Guess Who? Because I, I don't know anything else they did. 
What is it? Except this. What is it? American Woman. Oh, yeah. Stay away from me. Stay away from me. It's a good me. song. Do you know that they're Canadian? Mm-mm. And this song's origins took the form of a live jam that emerged during a curling rink concert in southern Ontario. Pretty they, sweet. Yeah, they said it was a popular place for bands to play. Uh, but when Bachman was the name of the guy in the band that wrote it, he broke a string. He un- unknowingly played the riff to American Woman when tuning the replacement string. He played it louder and louder. And, and Cummings improvised the lyrics to fit what Bachman was playing. And some and they noticed some kid uh, was had a cassette recorder mm-hmm. making a bootleg leg recording. And they asked him for the tape because they wanted to figure out, hey, we want to record that. Oh, And that became the studio recording. May 30th, 1970, Ray Stevens, Everything is Beautiful. <laughs> Thanks Ray over the Stevens. billboard. Ray Stevens on the top of the billboard. I didn't, uh, I've never heard of Ray Stevens in my he's, life. He sings that. They call me the streak. He would always have... Those infomercials for Ray Stevens albums. You uh, know how they used to have uh, infomercials of like people yeah. for people's album. Yeah, and he would always have one, and it had like these cartoons that would go through it. And there's one song he sings about the streak, and it's some naked old man cartoon of this naked old man running. I have no idea what you're talking about, but this is a country song, and it's like everything it is beautiful in its own way. Now, Friday, June twelfth, nineteen seventy. Self-reportedly under the influence of LSD, Doc Ellis of the Pittsburgh Pirates threw a no-hitter against the San Diego Padres uh, to win 2 to nothing on Friday, June 12th, in the first game of a twilight doubleheader at San Diego Stadium. The, pro- the Pirates flew to San Diego on Thursday, June 11th, for a series against the Padres. Mm-hmm. Ellis reported that he visited a friend in Los Angeles and used L- in Los Angeles and used LSD two or three times. Thinking it was still Thursday, he took a hit of LSD on Friday at noon. Boom. And his friend's girlfriend reminded him at 2 p.m., oh, man, dog, you're scheduled to pitch tonight. Ellis flew, oh, shit. I don't know why she's a dog. Ellis flew from Los Angeles to San Diego at 3 p.m. and arrived at San Diego Stadium at 4.30 p.m. The game oh, started man. at 6.05 p.m. Ellis threw the no-hitter despite being unable to feel the ball or see the batter or catcher clearly. Oh, my God. Ellis said his catcher, Jerry May, wore reflective tape on his fingers, which helped him to see May's signals. Ellis walked... So he, the catcher must have known that he was on he LSD. He must have told him. Yo, man, I'm really fucking high right now. I'm getting tripping. <laughs> Ellis walked eight batters and struck out six. Oh, my God. And he was aided by excellent fielding plays from second baseman Bill Mazeroski and center fielder Matty Alou. A no-hitter. Matty Alou. Does Alou sound familiar? Yeah, Moises Moises Alou. Alou. Remember for the Cubs? That's his uncle. Okay. And as Ellis recounted, I can only remember bits and pieces of the game. I was psyched. I had a feeling of euphoria. I was zeroed in on the catcher's glove, but I didn't hit the glove too much. I remember hitting a couple of batters, and the bases were loaded two or three times. The oh, my ball, gosh. The ball was small sometimes. The ball was large sometimes. Sometimes I saw the catcher. Sometimes I didn't. Holy sometimes shit. Sometimes I tried to stare the hitter down the throw while I was looking at him. I chewed my gum until it turned to powder. I started having a crazy idea in the fourth inning that Richard Nixon was the home plate umpire. And once I thought I was pitching a baseball to Jimi Hendrix, <laughs> who to me was holding a guitar and swinging it over the plate. They say I had about three to four fielding chances. I remember diving out of the way of a ball I thought was a line drive. I jumped, but the ball wasn't hit hard and never reached me. Ellis reported that he never used LSD during the season again, though he continued though he continued to use amphetamines. After the story was made public, he said he regretted taking LSD that day because it robbed him of his greatest professional memory. I, but I wonder would he have been able to do it without the LSD? A no hitter. I know that's what I'm saying. You know what a no hitter is? Yeah. Like, nobody got a hit. I mean, that's do you, unheard don't, of. don't you think it must have been the LSD that did that? No, no. He was probably pretty good. No. But it's how amazing he, that he can do it with the LSD. But did he ever do it without? Oh, I'm sure he did. I don't know. No, I'm, I'm not sure he did. No. I don't know anything. That's what I'm saying. Well, maybe it was the LSD that something about being no, on and that. No, because then he would fucking do it all the time and so would everybody else. But maybe, maybe it was just he something thought weird he with was him. Pe- he thought he was pitching a fucking Jimmy Hendrix. I Hendrick. know. He couldn't see That's anything. insane. No idea what was going on. But what I think it is is, though, it's all just mechanics. It's just like yeah. you're a pitcher and you become, you know, learning the mechanics. But holy shit. Can you imagine trying to do that? I don't think I could do anything on LSD. No, I, I, have, no, I have no idea I what it's like. I've I never taken either. it. Yeah. I've been scared to death of taking it, but yeah. I have a friend who took took it once, 
uh, with some other friends that were taking. He had a what they call a bad trip that he was just freaking out the whole fucking time, and I had to take, we had to all take care of him. Oh, really? Because he was like, oh, the government's out to get me. You guys are spies. And June 13th, 1970, <laughs> the Beatles, yeah, the long and winding road took over the Billboard's top chart. Top it's one top. of my le- less favorite Beatles yeah, songs. I listen to it. It's not good. Yeah. I don't like it. it I know sucks. the song. I just, it's, yeah, it's it not sucks. one of my favorites. And I will say this probably was only... Up there because it's the Beatles. And they were going away and they're like, oh, well, that's a Beatles song. Better put it in the number one. It could be. No, it sucks. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Beatles fans. That song sucks. The Long and Winding Road is not a good song. Yeah. It's like they took a poem and and decided to make it into a song. Like it was a poem first or something. Well, something that might have added to its suckiness is that Phil Spector uh, took the song and added orchestral and choral overdubs. That's a big part of it that makes it so bad. Yeah. And... uh, his modifications pissed off Paul McCartney to the point that when the when he made his case to the British High Court for the Beatles' dissolution, mm-hmm. he cited the treatment of the long and winding road as one of his six reasons for breaking up. The he road. had to go to a high court, I guess, to I disband yeah, the Beatles. I don't, know. I don't know. I don't know. Why couldn't they just break up like everybody else? I don't know. I don't know. Apparently, he had to do that because they were so good. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I didn't do the research. Maybe I should. Yeah. And report back next week, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you should. But he he said Phil Spector fucking with that. Phil Spector with giant fucking hair. That's bizarre. Saturday, June 27, 1970, the Jackson 5. The Jackson 5 take over the Billboard chart and knock the Beatles right off. Okay. They're only from the 13th to the 26th. The Love You Save. Stop. The Love You Save might be your own. I, I, I know that song. Marlon and Tito. Mm-hmm. Are the greatest Jacksons of all time. Marlon now, um, and Tito. This features the side vocals of Jermaine Jackson singing alongside Michael in the final. Stop the love you say. Jermaine baby, Jackson had own. his own music, didn't he, in it the was, 80s? It wasn't good. No, I know. Besides Marlon. All right. But I don't think Marlon and Tito ever did anything on their own. The open, the opening exclamation stop and the foot stomps that complement the rhythm during the latter part of the song mm-hmm. are allusions to the 1965 number one. So Michael who were the five? It was Marlon, Ma- the name Marlon, Tito, Michael, well, Michael, Jermaine. Michael, Jermaine, Michael, Jermaine, Marlon, Tito. Who is the fifth one? Randy. Okay. Is that right? Wait. Not the Randy Jackson that's from. No. There was a Randy, though. But it's an allusion to the number, to the 1965 number one Motown single by the Supreme. Stop in the name yep. of love. So it's going to just be sort of a homage. Homage. homage yeah. Homage. Um, you almost called it an homage. Homage. All right, and that brings us to the end of part and, and one. We're gonna leave. We're gonna leave the first episode of 1970 on the motherfucking Jackson Five because they're right. great. And. Thank you for listening, and be sure to check us out on Twitter at History for Jerks. And thank you to the um, Queen City Podcast Network. Yes. Shout out. What up? We're in a network, y'all. All right. We're in a network. And it is time to get out of here, Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry, we're in a network, you motherfucker. Get out of the bathroom. <laughs> All right. I Take it you. easy. I love you. Take it away, Matt Truman. American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network. For more information, go to queencitypodcastnetwork.com.